I'm Jason Sylvia, and this is The Creative Capital Show. A show about creative people and how those creative people turn into entrepreneurs by taking their creativity and turning it into a business and facing all the trials and tribulations along the way. Some say to be successful in business, you have to separate the business and its decisions from yourself and your emotions. Others have said that to be successful in business, you need to have high emotional intelligence and that your business should be a representation of you. For this episode's guest, Julia Broom, she chose the latter as a strategy for success. Julia is the owner and founder of Kin Southern Table and Bar, a restaurant that offers classic Southern soul food dishes, all made with love. But this is not just a story about opening a restaurant. It's a story about how food can be tied closely to memories, how a major emotional experience can be the catalyst for a dream, and how sometimes you have to go all in, mind, heart, body, and soul, to make that dream a reality. So sit back and listen as we dive into the food vibes, and soul that make Ken and its owner, Julia, so very special. Enjoy. Julia, Julia Broom. Hi. Thank you. Thank Thank you for coming on. Thank you. I'm still a chicken, but I'm I'm here. I'm a chicken selling chicken. You're chicken selling chicken. That won't be the title for the episode, but that's really tempting that you put that out there. I'm like, we, that, I don't know. You know what? That might be a merch idea for you. Something you can. Chicken selling chicken. Chicken selling chicken. I'm ordering a hoodie tomorrow. <laughs> get one of those, like, what is it? Vista print hoodies. They, they're like, we could get 60 of them in two Listen, days. I got a delivery coming tomorrow. <laughs> I should have thought of this last week. Chicken selling chicken. There you go. You're, you're welcome. If, if, it, if it sells like crazy, just give me like 5%. of Five? The, yeah. Five percent. Think about it. <laughs> can we give me a little less? It's Black History Month. Two break. Two percent. Two, 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 <laughs> two, two sounds reasonable. All right. Two percent of the gross profits of a t-shirt or, or a hoodie that may or may not be gangbusters. <laughs> we are here to talk about chicken and a number of other things uh, because we are sitting inside your wonderful establishment, Kin. Yeah. And for those who are outside of Providence and if you're listening to this, thank you. And or if they are in Providence and they've never been to Kin, also thank you that you're listening to this. Um, just a brief, you know, like elevator pitch, I guess, of who are you and what do you do? Sure. My name is Julia Broom. I am the owner of Kin Southern Table and Bar. We are a full service restaurant with about 50 seats and we specialize in Southern comfort food or what we like to call in the black community soul food. So we offer everything from fried chicken, to catfish, baked mac and cheese, collard greens, all the sugar, all the butter that you need. I mean, the stuff that makes food delicious. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the good stuff. Yeah, exactly. The good stuff. may not be good for you, but it's the stuff that makes it tasty. Or maybe it is good for you. I don't, I don't know anymore. In certain amounts, yes. There you go. <laughs> um, so we're sitting here in Providence, and... You're a native of South Providence, if I'm not mistaken. I am. Born and raised right between Broad Street and Elmwood Avenue on Warrington. And so, you know, born and raised growing up in South Providence, but then as far as inspiration for the food and for this place, it's not strictly a Providence, New England affair Mm -hmm. because your mom's side of the family is uh, from Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Virginia, Carolinas, absolutely. And so I want to go into, um, there was, I think it might've been from an interview. It's either an interview or something or other. I want to go with this quote because I think this is a good starting off point to talk about just your, your history with food and growing up. Um, but you were saying that, you know, you had some certain childhood memories that you hold dear. Um, you know, your aunt birdie's garden, getting fresh vegetables, um, rolling out biscuits, your great grandmother's cast iron skillet, uh, and you know all those kind of things that yeah. influence what would 
later become what we're, what we're sitting in right now, kin. Can you just go through those early food memories, whether they were in Providence or Virginia, were they a mix of the two and how much they made? They obviously made an impact. I think it's like a wonderful, powerful thing. But can you just walk through those early food memories and why they made such an impact on you? Well, first, my family, they're, they're a naval family. So everybody sort of moved up here decades ago. And I'm the lonely soldier that was born and raised here in Providence. So when it came to food, everything that they, you know, bestowed upon me and prepared was stuff that they had learned from, you know, other generations. And that's kind of what we hold dear to us is our recipes. Um, so my earliest memories, um, because we are a naval, I have my Aunt Bernie lived down in Newport, well, Middletown, right next to the naval base. Oh, okay. Um, with my uncle Robert, who still lives there, still has the garden, and he still has me come out and pick collard greens. I'm not even kidding. Um, so you're still doing even even now, even with this place. Absolutely, and everything. he's like, Jules, come get this stuff. I'm like, all right. I love free vegetables and like, tomatoes go. and basil. But yeah, we're like picking vegetables right out of the garden. I mean, we'd have tea that we'd let sit out. We call it sun tea that we drink on Sundays. Usually every Sunday we'd come together as a family and that was kind of, these these dishes are the stuff that we'd eat almost every weekend. Um, whether it was something like fried chicken or collard greens, these are the stuff that we'd, you know, just live for and share. But yeah, I also remember spending time with like my great grandmother, Julia, who lived with us when, um, when I was younger. I got to spend some quality time with her, but it's still her recipes. I still have her cookboard, cookbooks. She was born in like 1910, and I still have them. It's like such a crazy family lineage that gets to like live on like through food and through those recipes. And speaking of that, so what was the earliest recipe that was in your family that like you got to cook like all, like all the way through? Meaning like you weren't just helping, but like the first recipe that you got to like maybe mm. master or get the hang of. Probably collard greens. Okay. It's such a process. I think uh, traditionally, um, you know, you cut them, clean them, chop them up, and then using whatever sort of meat product we do. So now when I'm at home, I make them with bacon. Who doesn't love bacon? Um, but we here at Can we do with the smoked turkey. In my family, they do ham hocks or what other random piece of pork or shoulder they could get. But it's just a slow simmering process. Put a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that. It's gold. And was was your great your great grandma like the the head of the family when it comes to like anything and everything food? Absolutely. Like like, like there was like no question. It was like no great grandma no. determines no. how like, food goes she down. She was the cook. She was the everything. Yeah, Julia held it down. She had all the dishes. She was a phenomenal baker, great cook. Because oh, so so she was all in the kitchen. Right, so she passed it down to my mother, Patsy, and my aunts. Um, and that's kind of where I learned to cook was from them. So it was, it was a generational thing that was just passed down from, Absolutely. from person to person. Did you have, in those early years, like, you know, you're, you're surrounded by what seems to be these, like, amazing, great food memories and, like, food culture that's around you in an early age where you're like, Oh yeah. Like my future is going to be in food. No. So there was no, <laughs> it wasn't like an early on thing. Like, yeah, like nope. I'm, I'm going to open a restaurant or something. So this is not, this is not a result of childhood aspirations. I mean, part of it is, okay. I think when I was growing up, I was watching my mom, like going, going to school. She went to school after I was born. She went back to college. Um, so she was taking marketing classes at Johnson Wales. She also went to URI. I sat in some of her classes with her and was learning and trying to answer all the questions that the other college kids That's were That's amazing. Yeah, because I was a little smarty pants. Um, but no, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I think when I probably was in elementary school, I did think of, you know, creating my own restaurant after I had this very wonderful time at Disney World. You been on the rides? You go on the rides? I thought I was going to create one of those restaurants where you like, take a boat to the to the table 
that you want to go to. Oh, okay. So like a restaurant, but like with, within oh. like some kind of crazy theme. Right. I it was like an amusement park. I was like, oh yeah, this is sick. That would be so cool if you could take a boat to your seat. Take, take a boat to your seat and then yeah, like and then just pull up. A, pull up. Pull up <laughs> to your table. If anybody's listening to this and needs a restaurant idea, Listen, find, I want find a, a sand dune. <laughs> <laughs> and they just people just pull up. I think, I think those already exist, but like if we could get one around New England we area. We don't have that in Providence. Yeah. You know what? I should have did that. I mean, with with the way flooding has happened and with certain bridges they... being closed, I feel like we could, like, I don't know, some kind of like ice boat pull up thing. We got, I don't no, know, no somebody longer. else. Yeah, somebody else figure it out and just just give us both a cut. Right. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Give Give Julie five percent. I'll take two. Um, <laughs> this numbers are sounding great. Just two percent. <laughs> I'm just I'm gonna get rich the microwave. I'm just gonna put out all these ideas and then just two percent of each one. I hope you guys are taking notes. <laughs> yeah, just in case this ever ends up in court. Like, Jason, you said two percent, god damn it. Right. I want my five. <laughs> so speaking of college yeah. and marketing, just to fast forward, um, you went to school in Boston, if I'm not mistaken. I did. I went to Boston University. What did you major in? I studied business management and had a concentration in marketing. Which my mother told me not to do. So basically, <laughs> you are already being a little smartass. I've always been and, a smartass. And trying to answer those marketing questions. And that just stuck with you. And you're like, you know what? Right. I was, I was doing it when I was a little kid. Might as well just do it now. I know. So when I first got accepted to BU, I went into the College of General Studies. And so they kind of give you like two years to figure out what you really want to do. And uh, I was like, okay, I love hospitality. I love business. Um, I was like, oh, our hospitality school is pretty new. I'll go with the business school. We'll see how that goes. And then uh, I told my mom after I'd already transferred. Oh, so you, you like, after like, like, oh, well, it's already happened. So. I knew she was going to fight me on it. So <laughs> I was like, so I decided to go to business school. What, why, why do you think she would fight you on it if that was like the path? Because usually it's the other way around. Like parents want their kids to do the exact same path they did. And the kid's like, I don't want to do this. I don't think she had a problem with the business school. It's the marketing concentration. I think she wanted me to really go into finance. Oh, okay. Um, I think when it comes to like working in the corporate world, um, when it comes to marketing budgets, marketing budgets is usually the first thing to get cut. Usually. So I've seen my mom be laid off from, you know, her marketing job. So she's like, I don't want that for my kid. I want her to have some more stability. So was there any other factors, whether it was from growing up or like things that you were into that you're like, yeah, business, marketing, like this is what I should really go study? Well, I've always, like when I was a little, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was like selling hot popcorn to my neighborhood kids when they were <laughs> playing and everything. So I was, I think it was one summer I was racking up on the popcorn. I started doing frozen lemonades, tried to cut out the lemonade man. Oh, so you were trying to hit them both like, hey, I'm going to give you this like salty popcorn. You're going to want to drink. Right. You're going to want to drink and then I'm going to hit you with the lemonade. I'm going to get you both come, ways coming and going. Yeah, come see me. And then I sort of uh, elevated to the cookies and uh, started hustling my cousin who was going to Northeastern. His whole football team started selling them. So, you were, right. so you were leveraging like the idea of like the flip and like supply and demand and just making money that way yeah. from an early age. I got expensive taste. <laughs> <laughs> I knew my mom was like, girl, you need a job. I was like, all right, mom, let's do it. I'm like, all right, I'm like, like it's gonna be a job I'm gonna do though. I'm, yeah, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna do it my way. I'm calling the shots. <laughs> <laughs> so you go into school in Boston and there was one thing that uh, doing the research for this episode, um, so it's going to be a two-part question. The first one is, it's going to go into the second part. The first one is, in your own words mm. and in your own uh, opinion, how would you define soul food? Mm. Let's see. Um, that's a good one. I think it is, well, traditionally, soul food... I know a lot of people is very much related to the historical, you know, back in the days, slavery times, of course, um, where we would get, where, you know, the enslaved would be able to get food rationings from the masters or whatever they grew. So we sort of turned what we received into the best that we could. Um, and 
from that, I think that's sort of where we've gotten our recipes that have been passed down. Just sort of making use of these hearty ingredients and turning them into something delicious. So with that being said, that definition of soul food, you're in your time of going to school in Boston, the reason why I wanted to ask that first of this two part question. Mm -hmm. um, so I was reading an interview that you had that you, you were saying you were having a hard time finding soul food in Boston, which mm -hmm. sort of makes sense. It's like New England, like it's not known for soul food, but you would think that like in a, like in a metropolitan city that at least be some spots like- No, there are. Oh, there's okay, definitely okay, there some was. spots, okay. but they weren't on my campus. They were definitely, gotcha. you know, there's Slates, there's Daryl's, that are sort of like the main go-tos. Okay. But I had to venture off campus to to get them. Um, Did you have to come to Providence at any time or even venture further or was it just like you had to venture to those specific No, I spots? came home for like, gotcha. <laughs> I just came home. If I really wanted some good food, some good Southern food, I'd go home to my mama. Gotcha. So you're, you're in Boston, you have to come home for like the good, the good soul food, unless it's specific spots. Mm -hmm. You're learning marketing, you're learning business, and then you start working in the corporate world. And I've noticed there's um, there's marketing there, but also you helped open Plain Ridge Park and Casino. Like that's not an easy feat um, to to pull off. Just opening a casino in general. Mm -hmm. um, you ended up doing a specialized events. Can you walk us, uh, you know, us as in the listeners? just through your, your professional journey. Sure. Um, and because I got some questions about that too. Oh, I got questions for them too. No, <laughs> um, no fresh where's out of- Where's my money? <laughs> right, where's the rest of my money? Um, no, fresh out of college, I, I couldn't afford to live in Boston. I came back home, I worked for CVS headquarters. I was doing online merchandising for them. Um, so uploading the very wonderful products that they, they sell on CVS for CVS um, because of the economy then. Um, I was laid off. I was one of maybe 200 something odd people who were late, let go. So that was my first layoff. Um, after that, I kind of weaseled my way very luckily into working for the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau. So I was helping, I was, uh, what was I? to do. Um, I was like a coordinator. So I was helping sort of introduce any tourists that wanted to come into the city to attractions, but mostly working with meeting planners. Would, you, um, would that be considered like your first hospitality industry style job too? Or well, no? well okay. because you know, little Julia was a very much a little hun hungry girl. I worked, my first, first job was working at Chuck E. Cheese. Oh, okay. So that was my first hospitality job. Gotcha. Shaking hands, giving out buffalo wings, and beers to moms. Yeah, that was it. But <laughs> I'm just like picturing mom, like you're looking at, like mom's like, yeah, can I get a 32 ounce beer? And then you see their kid playing the ball pit. I'm like, yeah, you need it. <laughs> I'm like, like I, I see him running around. Yeah, I, I see him running around. You like, stress, like, baby like, girl. You need, you need this like, beer. Like, you know what? You need two. Here you go. <laughs> Wish I could have one too, but I'm too young. <laughs> No, but um, yeah, so my, my actual like full, first full-time job in hospitality was working for the Greater Boston CVB, the GBCVB. You say that five times fast. I can. If my you, mom still can't say the acronym. If you want to define what that ac ac acronym exactly is, so that way people don't have to guess. Sure, the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau. Okay. So they're the sort of people who help bring all the tourism to the city, all the big conventions and citywides to the city. So I was helping sort of selling meeting planners, different places to go. So I get to take them on tours to different places like Fenway Park, do you want to do an event here? Museum of Fine Arts. So I got to see all those beautiful venues. And then you're interact with, with the like, restaurants too. With, with major event planners to do major events at these places? Absolutely. Gotcha, okay. Absolutely, so like the local, like Yankee Dental and all these other random conferences that happen throughout the city every year. I was helping working with some of the smaller ones that worked in the hotels. And then I got to work on some of the larger conventions that were for the city. And what did that entail? Was it more like bringing like, hey, I've got sponsor X, restaurant Y, and like bar Z. So okay, like, let's bring this event together. Like, let, let, like, did you have to like pull all the pieces together? Was it more like 
planning the logistics of like, here's how things going to work out? Sort or? of introducing everybody to everybody. So okay. like, my name is Sally. I'm bringing in this conference. We have 10,000 people. We want to do an offsite event. Where should we go? Well, I represent all of our members. Do you want to take a duck tour to get there? <laughs> do you want to have your event at Fenway Park? You want your name on the billboard? Well, here's the duck tour people. Here's the Fenway Park people. Yo, guys, make it happen. Here's a proposal. This is how much it's going to cost you. Gotcha. Um, did you have anything to do with Anime Boston? Oh, my gosh. Um, no. All right. We can talk about that later. It's chaotic. I've got, I was going to say, I've got, I've got some opinions on Anime Boston. I'm um, going to reveal on the show, but... My friends secretly used to make fun of me and say that I loved Anime Boston because every year I had accidentally happened to be in the mall when it was happening. They're like, Julia, that's too much of a coincidence. You must yeah. love it. Why aren't you dressed I've up? Got, I've, Just embrace it. And I'm like, no, I really don't. I don't understand why I'm here I, again this I've, week. I've, I've got some opinions. I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at, um, I don't know, if we ever do a, if I ever do a Patreon for the show, maybe I'll make it like an extra. It's crazy. It's, it's, you haven't lived unless you've been in Mario Batali's Italy and you see like a young couple celebrating some kind of anniversary next to like a shirtless uh, mm-hmm. Goku want to be talking to or like Pikachu, Harley a Quinn homemade Pikachu outfit next to a homemade Pikachu and they're, they're trying to eat pasta through their costumes. It's but imagine, I love the years when it rains too. Like that's sad, but like when it rains, all the poor homemade costumes, they get all beat up. It's even worse is the smell, but I won't get into that. Yeah. That's, that's, not. Yeah, that's anyway, anyway, that's conference life for you. <laughs> it's trade shows. So you're doing, so you're doing, um, you know, you're bringing all these people together for these, like, events in the mm-hmm. greater Boston area, and then... That's kind of really where I started having a big love for different restaurants, because I actually okay. got to meet with a lot of the restaurateurs and introducing them to these meeting planners who were looking to do their events. So I got to sample a lot of food. Did you get exposed to, like, parts of the restaurant industry that, like, you didn't even know, like, were, were a thing, or, like, certain business practices in restaurants because you're talking with them on, like, not just a patron food level but like a business like coordination level yeah i think i definitely was able or got exposed to really just more events like actually what it takes to compose an event for a thousand to ten thousand people there's a lot of work like Um, the logistics the logistics of it has to be insane because it's like all right we have to get everybody like into the event, make sure everybody's accounted for. Like, do we have entertainment? Do we have speakers? Do we like have enough AV? trash cans? Do you have enough trash cans? Such a random question, but you gotta have trash cans, man. You do, do you have like food and refreshments? Do we have enough to like cover everybody? And then insurance for a lot of that stuff. All that too. stuff. Yep. And then also, even just things like like lighting and things of like that kind of sense. Setting people that people don't like think about that yeah. you had to like take into consideration. Absolutely. It was like, surprise, we want to do a present a PowerPoint presentation or something on screen. Well, there's no screens in here. We and you're like, yeah, it. like we don't have a screen. We it's gotta like, build it. Who's gonna build it? How what time are they gonna get here? When's set up? Yeah, when like, breaking it down. Which A V contract am I gonna call at this time? Do we have the electrical power to do so? Yeah, do we have enough sockets? Do we have like extension cords that can run? Like anything yeah. like that. Every little bit of it just downloading into my brain. This is stuff I need to know. So you're learning all that experience, and then that eventually led to... I ended up going to Showcase Live at Patriot Place first. Okay, yeah, because I, w- I wanted to ask about that. So, so you went from Greater Boston. Like, so what led you to Showcase Live? Like, why was Showcase Live like the next like, evolutionary step, I guess? Well, while I was working at the Convention and Visitors Bureau for Boston, I was still commuting from Providence. So commuting every day that, that distance took a lot. Plus, I wanted to be paid more for what my contribution. I felt like I deserved a raise at that point. Um, I'd been there for like two or three years. And um, I really wanted to get more hands-on with events. I felt like, all right, kind of, that's sort of my wheelhouse. I really like working on that. So I was lucky enough to land that position there. And so what were you, was it just more of the same type of work or were you like learning and picking up new skills doing the showcase live work no at showcase live i was the event manager for the building so i was booking and detailing all of their social events so we had someone who was doing like all their shows yep i was doing everything else so corporate events birthday parties weddings mitzvahs 
all of that. And so from beginning to end, so booking, doing floor plans, scheduling staff, working on menus, signing contract and executing the event the day of. So yeah. end to end the buck stop with you. Absolutely. And then that led to Plain Ridge? Yes. Okay, so Plain Ridge Park, because I thought this was interesting as I was like going through, like you helped open Plain Ridge Park Casino. I did, yeah. That, okay. Let's talk about that for a little bit because opening anything, like any business. That was my first big opening. Yeah, like it's insane enough. And it's like, hey, we're going to open a casino. Like that is some. That to is the some, public, the first casino yeah. in Massachusetts. That, and also I'm just thinking of like, the movie Casino, which I know is sort of based on some stuff and sort of based on not on some stuff, <laughs> but just the, you know, and even back then it looked insane that like, of like the like things you had to deal with in like just opening Casino, like the, like, I know it's a fictional movie, but it's kind of funny how like watching Robert De Niro, like, <laughs> like piss and moan about the amount of blueberries and a muffin and how he went back there and like took care hey, of himself. you gotta watch your food costs. Well, were there any, hold on, before we get into it, were there any moments like that? Did you have like a blueberries and the muffin conversation with anybody? Because if so, that's amazing. I'm like, you guys are putting too many fries on the plate. There's too much pulled pork into pulled pork sliders. There's sliders. This is not a whole sandwich. What are we doing here? That actually happened? That happened. That is am- All right, so. On a you, weekly basis. Can you, go, can you go through like how you got into that position and what is it just like, oh, we're, we're going to open this casino. It's the first one in mass and it, it better be good. Sure. Well, yeah. Showcase Live laid me off. So that was layoff number two. Um, so they kind of just used me for a test run for a year. I think they were just trying to figure out what they wanted to do with that business. Oh, so it's like, hey, here's this like experimental prototype. Let's go right then, here, see what and, she does. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, all right, here's what we learn, and bye. Yeah, they're like, thanks for coming, thanks for playing, have a good day. So. And we'll get somebody in for cheaper who doesn't know what you know. <laughs> exactly. They're like, you're cute, but you gotta go now. <laughs> So um, I'm just it, nobody can see it. But I'm just shaking my head because like I've seen that I happen so many times where it's like, it's cool, like, well, like how much can I do, bro? Yeah, yeah it's it's like cool. Like we gave you this like opportunistic position. You did your own stuff. We learned everything we needed from you and buy and we'll hire. And now that we have all your notes, we're gonna hire somebody at half of what we paid you. Yeah, actually, I think it's a video game spot now. You can go there and play video games. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that stinks. But, um, so Plain Ridge. Plain Ridge. Um, yeah, I was hired by the legendary Barry Rhodes. Um, wonderful gentleman was our um, VP of food and beverage. Um, when I started at Plain Ridge, um, they hired me up. I like, think we were next door to a pizza shop. Like we interviewed me a couple times there. Because they were still building it. Um, the only thing that they had there was... Oh, so it was, it was still under construction. It wasn't it was like under the construction, construction was done and like we need to like fill My this first place day, now. they were like, here's a hard hat. Like, go Holy sit. Sh- okay. Go sit in the racing track building. We're not done. Yeah. You're like, wow. I'm All like, right. oh, this is going to be the banquet room that I oversee? Yeah. They're like, yeah. I was like, so this is obviously not going to get done until the very end. Yeah, and you're like looking, you're like... This is concrete. And there's a giant gaping hole somewhere. There's stuff hanging over my head, loosely. Yeah, like that's like could. How do I kill sell me. it? How do I sell this space? <laughs> Here, have your your wedding. And what and what was the what was the position? Was it food and beverage related, or was it like an like another end to end position? Where it was, it was like, another end to end. So okay, I was so a banquet was manager, banquet sales manager. Um, but because obviously my space wasn't ready, so they're like, "Girl, you're part of our food and beverage team. Help us out." So in the first few months, I helped open Slacks, which is the uh, seafood fine dining restaurant that they have there. So I helped with the training. So that wasn't even in like technically in your job purview. No, but, they're but like, you're, like you're, you're here and like we're you're paying here? you. You're like here? All right, you're going to help open this restaurant. I don't know. Shut up. You're going to help open this restaurant. Listen, they're like, actually, we need to hire at least 500 people. Help us with that as well. So wow, okay. I was, we were hiring people like... 30, so 40 at a time. So you're like interviewing people. So you're doing yeah. a little bit of everything. For because this, my room wasn't ready. For this giant facility, yeah. this casino. I'm a body. I'm being paid. I gotta do something with myself. <laughs> but you learn so much, like hiring people. It's definitely something I've had to, you know, translate every position. I'm taking pieces of it. It's helping me with kid. What other stuff besides, hey, help open this restaurant, help hire these people, Oh, go, what's going on? Besides go help promote that we're opening. So I was helping HR with their marketing too, because they're sending us out to go interact in the community, 
as a banquet person, you really kind of do have to be, or if you're an event person, you do have to make connections with people in the community. So I instantly went out to like the Chambers of Commerce, the CVB that I used to work for, you know, all those different So you're groups. doing like the business version of like a politician. You're like, all right, I gotta go like- Okay, I, you guys, we're coming. Yeah, we're I, opening. I gotta go like shake hands and kiss babies type of thing. I say that at least once a month. I gotta go shake something. I go shake it. You go, gotta shake some shit up. Yeah. People need to know you're out there. So you're doing all this extra peripheral work, yeah. which I'm sure, you know, you're getting skills that you maybe, or learning lessons that you didn't even think you were going to learn. And then what happened as far as like the actual job you were supposed to do? You had this bank room that wasn't finished I yet. Mean, so I mean, I got to it. Work out? I okay. got to it eventually. Okay. So once, <laughs> um, once the event space was finished, we did like a huge open house, um, but yeah, it did require a lot of the time, like letting people know that we were there. So I was definitely out networking, letting people know that we were opening the space, um, creating all sorts of marketing materials to let, you know, our menu, this is what the facility looks like now. Sort of creating all that from scratch with our marketing team, designing it. It sounds like a, almost like a very like, to, to relate it to like another world that I'm more familiar with, it seems like a very startup type of thing when you have like a startup like a tech like a tech startup where it's like hey we hired you for this but we also want you to do these 20 other things because we don't have right. those positions and you're here go do it even at showcase live when i got there we redid all the marketing materials for that space as well so people could see it so i think this is a perfect way to kind of transition into this the i don't want to say second half but like how kin would start but before we get into that I want to ask, so all that experience from, you know, working in Boston, working for Showcase, mm -hmm. working um, for Plain Ridge and helping open a freaking casino, that, that still blows my mind. They could be like, hey, I'll, like, hey that, that thing, yeah, I helped open that, no big deal. Um, <laughs> what, and especially in the, the latter, because it was, as you were saying, like you had to do all these different things that you didn't think you were going to do. What mm -hmm. skills did you pick up and learn that, you know, looking back like now that you have like the benefit of hindsight yeah um benefited you when starting and operating kin which we're gonna get into the genesis of that but uh mm -hmm. but yeah like like what like what do you think that you picked up that maybe you didn't even realize till after the fact like oh wow i picked up all these like things from this like corporate life that helped me in my like when i started doing my own thing yeah i think um working for the convention and visitors bureau that taught me about I think it definitely helped me with, you know, being the little shy person I thought I was and sort of getting more out there. We would have these monthly open houses and it really encouraged me to just network every month. So the, our boss would be like, all right, you got to get out there, give out 15 business cards, you get 15 business cards. Next week, try to beat everybody else and get in more. So it really made me better at interacting with people. I think, what was it? Showcase Live? That taught me to make a splash really big, really quickly, because sometimes maybe all you have is a year. So it's like you might as well just do it, like whatever it takes, whatever go you hard. can. Yeah, go and, hard. Go hard and see what paint. happens. Yeah, you got to go for it. And then Plain Ridge taught me that sometimes you have, to, you have to interact with other departments. And sometimes, well, for Kin, other departments is other businesses, other local businesses, working with people at City Hall, working with other departments of the state. You really have to constantly interact. I feel like I've learned something from each one. And, and then I went off into uh, doing more trade shows. And also you learn how to like hire people, which I don't think everybody gets that experience oh. unless you're like a manager of like, you have to evaluate people and see if they're a good fit for an organization. Yeah, I made one lady cry. I'm not proud of it. So say, was it deserved though? <sighs> Poor Barbara, I'm Miss Barbara, wherever you are, I'm sorry. It wasn't just me, it was really, it was, there was someone else with me. We like. You know, like in Step Brothers, where two of them go to show up for oh. the interview? <laughs> it was two of us interviewing her, and I don't think she enjoyed it. She didn't like it. Just when he was like, hello, Miss Lady. <laughs> yeah, it was two of us. I was like, oh, hello, Miss Lady. You want a job? And then she Did just... you do like a good cop, bad cop? Were you the bad cop? Is that I... how that works? Yeah, I let him be the bad cop. He was, oh, so you were it was his first cop. day. It was so his first day. I was like, you can be the bad cop. So you were the bad cop. So it's not your fault. What were you apologizing for? I know. I had him be the bad cop, though. <laughs> But, but you know what? We still laugh about it. Didn't, didn't have a gun to his head. He, he, like, no, it seemed like he got into it, so. She wasn't prepared, though, really. Wait, what was that person's name? Let's just blame it on that guy. Oh, Mike Fishman. All right, it's all your fault. 
Yeah. Mike, you should be apologizing. Michael Fishman. Yeah. If you're listening to this. He lives at, just kidding. Somehow. <laughs> you feel bad about yourself. No. I it's mean, all your we, fault. Yeah. yeah. He's like, but it was my first day. Why'd you do that to me? Does, doesn't matter. You know what? Welcome to, yeah. welcome to Plain Ridge. Yeah. Yeah. Game of, game of, game of slots. <laughs> 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 anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then we took him to a concert after and promoted the casino somewhere and we had fun then. We made up for it. He still should feel bad. He does. <laughs> Good. I just text him Barbara all the time and then he just laughs. Good, yeah. Just let that haunt you. I'm gonna text him right now. Haunt your, haunt your dreams. Miss Barbara's still <laughs> looking for oh, poor woman. So you ended up doing more events. Yeah. And what would, what happened where, because I, I read that, Ken, the, the, the thing we're sitting in now was, that was the retirement idea. Yeah, this is a cute little retirement project. It's a lot of work for someone retired. But what happened that you were working events, it seemed like things were going good, like what, what, what was like a catalyst that happened that, oh, I better get on this thing like, that I thought was going to be a retirement project now. Yeah, I was, I was feeling a little burnout from... The casino, um, casino. It's a twenty-four hour business. And also, you, there's no windows. Like you can't tell what there's time no of day windows. it is. You have no idea how it's sad that is. with your brain. I need fresh sunlight at all times. Please, please. So, um, I was offered a position. I was sort of recruited for. Um, actually, I think I had initially submitted my application to work at this place when I was like fresh out of college. And then they came back years later. We're like, hey, your resume was on file. You want to work for us? And you're like, how long have you had this thing on right. file? It's been years. <laughs> Thank you. It's been updated since then. Right. And exactly. It was, <laughs> it was like a five-month process of recruiting me. And I ended up working for um, Global Experience Specialists. Um, and he had an office in Foxborough. But global, global company um, doing trade shows events all throughout the world um and i was like okay yeah i could do a desk job i'm sick of setting up coffee stations at seven o'clock in the morning with no help yeah, so, put, put me i'm not trying to be a a cop on the beat put me behind give me a desk give me a desk job yeah, give job. me a desk job i'm tired man <laughs> so um i ended up transitioning over there and was really excited to be an account manager i had my own um clients that I was working with on their shows and on their exhibit booths um, and shipping stuff all around the world. And then uh, COVID happened. And so there goes layoff number three for my very short career. <laughs> so layoff number three happens. Yeah. COVID happens. Yeah. What was, what in your head was like, instead of, hey, I've experienced layoffs before. I mean, COVID is its own thing, but you've experienced layoffs. Like you said, it was layoff number three. Mm -hmm. What in your head was like, no, this is, I'm not going, I'm not going back into like a paid job. Like what, was there like a, like, like a deciding moment? Was there like an aha moment or was it just more like lingering over time? Um, I think it was like an aha. I thought, you know, after the first time you're laid off, I'm like, all right. It's cool, take this little break, look, and we'll be active and try to find a position. The second layoff, I took that personally. I'm Virgo, I take everything personally. The third one, I was like, all right, I'm tired of people laying me off. I'm gonna take control of my career. It's been such a short career. And the fact that I keep getting laid off when it's stuff that's not on my control, which I'm a control freak, um, made me be like, all right, I need to do something where I'm in control of my career, my destiny, I'm not going to have somebody lay me off again. So that, that decision of like, I want to control my own path and my own future and like what happens right. is what became, what was the catalyst for wanting to start Kin. Exactly. And so I had all of this free time because we're on lockdown. Um, and I just grabbed my giant post-its and started brainstorming. Now what, you know, there's so many different types of businesses that somebody can start. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious as to what was, was there a certain event or a certain thing where you're like, yes, starting and running a restaurant 
versus because you came from the event space, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, maybe I'll just be a, I'll be a consultant. Like I'm already doing this now. I'll, I'll just go to other people and like, do, like kind of do the freelance thing or be, mm-hmm. or start my own consulting company or start my own events company. And I'll help people do events yeah. rather than opening a restaurant. Like what was the decision making behind restaurant? Like that's the thing I need to I do. I went through all those thoughts. Oh, so you did. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Can, can you, can you walk us through that? Yeah, like, I, I think that's like, interesting. Right, so event consulting, that seems great, but all right. Um, they just did a shutdown. You can't have more than five people in a group. That's not going to turn around for a while. Um, let's see. But I'm still ordering pizza from the guy around the corner. The guy, I'm still giving him business around the corner. So I, people still need to eat. Okay. That sounds good. I need to eat. What do I, what am I going to eat today? What do I feel like? Um, is it, it going to be fried green tomatoes? Because I heard that's the, your oh favorite God, thing on the menu. Oh, fried green tomatoes. Oh, my God. Um, no, I just started like playing around with food and then, um, no, I mean, coming from an events background and being as one, um, magazine said laid off and lonely, I just started thinking about all, that, that's a t-shirt idea, but that's also just, ouch, like that's just a yeah. punch. Of, God. <laughs> Oh, another, another it was a good article though. No, another, another, I was really appreciative. I, I remember the headline of it, but, but now that now we're talking about like chicken selling chicken, I'm like, I don't know. There's another merch idea. <laughs> Laid off and lonely, <laughs> ready for my comeback. Um, no, I mean, being an events person, I went into events and hospitality because I love being around people, and I love seeing people enjoy themselves. So, I was thinking, all right, well, people are still going to need food. People are going to want to come together after COVID goes away, which I thought, oh, yeah, give it a year. Maybe we'll, we'll be all right. Um, still here. But I thought people would want a place to come together. And then George Floyd happened, and I was like, I'm probably going to cry, by the way. I should have warned you before. Um, I was just thinking. Do whatever you need to do. It's- <sighs> we're going to need a place for people uh, people who look like me, people of color, to have a safe space to come together and be together and enjoy the food that I grew up on. No. So, um, yeah, it was really, the George Floyd thing really got to me. And I can, I did just, just for those listening, <laughs> like, I, I was willing to stop a We'll, we'll keep I, you you sure you good I'm good now okay I got the first like whimper out I'm all right and um so obviously this is you know kin is something near and dear to your heart yeah. just from the emotion I'm getting just from that that it catalyst and that event so the tragic event that is George Floyd which has sparked a number of things seemingly sparked this this thing that we're sitting in now like we're actually sitting in this idea which is mind-blowing in and of itself like you had an idea and like now like it's physically here right which is why i cried a lot when we first opened and thank you to my opening staff because i was just a wreck i was a wreck and the reason why i'm saying that like hey this there's this emotional catalyst that happens right and now we're sitting here in this in in this idea that you had Mm-hmm. That was that was born out of you know wanting to control your own destiny, wanting to blaze your own path, wanting a space where people who who look like who look like you and wanting for a space for allies for, too and, and, ally, and allies too yep and allies Everybody. too uh, can can feel at home and be themselves. And I have questions about about that a little bit later. Yeah. So you have all you know you have all this going on. What was the first step? Like, just if you can recall that, like, what was the first step? Besides, like, the idea and, hey, I want to do this, like, what was the first step for you? Giant post-its. I got one right there with my to-do list. So um, just, just, like, kind of, like... Um, you just got to put your ideas on paper. And putting, it, and putting it out into the universe and just putting out the right. intention. And so, having been the business student that I was, um, part of our requirement at BU is uh, when you're at the business school, is you have to come up with a, you have this semester long project, you work on a business plan with a group. So I'd already been able to work on a business plan before. I knew what it entailed. My mom's an entrepreneur. She's done business plans before. It's like I got to put all these beautiful ideas, this brainstorm 
into a document. And so I started writing the, the business plan for it and kind of snowballed. Before I get into the next question, because you know, having this emotional moment right now and drawing on these emotions from, from earlier when you're recollecting like things like George Floyd, things like, things like getting laid off, like having, having yeah. these like sentiments, right. That, you know, pushed you and I would assume helped push you and help drive you to like the success you now have today. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't even think about asking this question, but I think it's a perfect time to ask it. Uh, sometimes, and I've noticed this just coming from the corporate world and maybe you've noticed it too, where it's, You've got people who, I don't want to say emotions are discouraged, but it almost seems like the emotional idea, the creative, it's, it's like, at least in like the corporate world, sometimes it's discouraged. It's like, no, you go with, you go with the, you don't go with the risky thing. You go with the thing that makes money. Right. You go with the thing that's like a short bet. You take your, you know, I'm doing air quotes here, calculated risks mm. and all these other things. Right. But then if everybody did that, and nobody did anything on emotion, and nobody was fired up, and nobody was, you know, um, tearing up about about their opening day, or tearing up about George Floyd, or 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 getting pissed off that like, hey, I'm I'm like I'm not going through another layoff, right? You wouldn't businesses like Kin wouldn't exist. Other businesses wouldn't exist. So, how? What advice would you give for somebody who's like, hey, I got these emotions, you know, based on like something that happened in the news and I want to go start something, whether it's a business or whether it's like a creative endeavor mm-hmm. or, um, you know, hey, like I'm getting treated this way at my job and like, but I, I have all these emotions and I have these ideas and it's, but it's like, what advice would you give to help sort them out and so that they can like turn it into something that whether it's a business, whether it's a, you know, community-based organization, because you, you were able to do it. Mm-hmm. I, I think sometimes people, you know, they're, they're sitting there and they, and they, it's like jumbled. It's like, it's like they have a hard time getting it out. What yeah. is the suggestion? Just writing it down, start plotting and planning. Cause then there's all, the whole paralysis analysis thing. So what advice would you give on that? Because, um, I didn't even think I was going to get into this question, but I think it's a perfect time to ask. No, it. I think the best thing to do is to push through. You just got to push through. If you have an idea, you have a concept, you're confident about it. Put your ideas on paper. Then you got to go and execute it. You got to be about the action afterwards. You got to follow up. You got to follow through. You, you got to just keep going. Accountable. You got to. Otherwise, it'll just be words on paper. And do you think a willingness to be vulnerable? Because I think that's like another thing too. It's like sometimes oh, it's, it's scary to put that idea out in the world. And like people are like, I'm not doing this. Are you kidding me? I was introducing myself. Hi, I'm Julia. I know this sounds a little crazy. It's COVID and stuff. But I want to open a restaurant. How can you help me get this done? How can you help me? And you'd be surprised how many people are like, girl, it is crazy, but you want to fill out this paperwork? (laughs) Let's go. Here's the paperwork you need. Go for it. You know what? Um, And ladies and gentlemen, they, them, what, what, if you're an alien and an intergalactic outer space and somehow this podcast got to you, uh, whoever happens to be listening to this, we didn't plan this, but I think it's a perfect segue into my next question, which is, You've got the idea, mm-hmm. you've got the dream, you've got the drive and willing to do it, yeah. right? You're, you wrote things down, uh-huh. all right? And that's all well and good, mm. but as you, I'm <laughs> assuming you most likely know, there's things like paperwork, there's things like business licenses, there's yeah. all these different things. And, money. And, and money, and money. Um, perfect that you said that. So, and it's not easy to navigate all that, especially for like a, like just a sole single person, let alone if you had like a group of people. Mm-hmm. So the reason why I'm asking that is, um, can you talk about the RI, and here's another acronym that I can't say two times as fast, the RISBDC <laughs> and community, not community, community, I can't talk now, Community Investment Corporation. Yeah. Um, how did both of those organizations come into play? What are those organizations? What do they do? And how do they help you out to get this dream oh, to become a reality? Absolutely. So I mentioned my mom went to URI and I got to get dragged to some of her classes. So uh, I was. You're, you're an unofficial alum. I'm an unofficial alum. <laughs> Like you can be a learned, uh, a learned doctor. Um, there you go. <laughs> from Step Brothers. <laughs> um, no, so I, my mom was like, if you're really serious about this, URI has a program. It's their small business development center. Reach out to them. See if your business plan really makes some sense. So I reached out and I was connected with a gentleman named Amit. 
and he helped me um, go through my business plan and fine tune it and make sure that the numbers made sense so that I could actually bring it somewhere to, uh, you know, to a bank or to whomever to get some money. Um, so I, you know, I'm sharing my business plan with banks. And of course, you're getting shot down because it's COVID and restaurants are closing. So why would we give you money to go and open a restaurant? What kind the of sense does that make? The profit margins in restaurant are not like They're these slim. gangbusters. It's yeah, not. Thing. You're not going to be a millionaire overnight. Um, so I was lucky enough to reach out to actually on Rhode Island Commerce's website. There's other um, places that if you're looking for unique places that give out money for business plans, I stumbled upon the Community Investment Corporation and I was able to get a loan for Ken, which helped. Um, I'd also at that point had, well, I had my 401k from GES, which had dwindled down because of the economy and everything. I closed that out and so, it went so, all in. So, that, so you cashed that in, that was your skin in the game. Cashed that in. Um, then I was on unemployment, I was just, I wasn't going anywhere. So I tried to save up as much of that as I could. So that was my skin in the game. Utilizing your emotions in business. They say control your emotions so that your emotions don't control you. And maybe that's why there's people out there who think you need to remove your emotions from your business decisions. For Julia, however, the story is the exact opposite. Julia was emotional about being laid off and feeling a lack of control over her own destiny. She was emotional about the events surrounding George Floyd, and that led to the desire to make a safe place for people that looked like her to enjoy the food she grew up on. She was emotional and cried when she first opened the doors to her business. Instead of denying her emotions, Julia utilized her emotions for the energy and passion that she would need to make her dream of turning kin into a reality. So, be like Julia. Don't deny your emotions. In regards to your business, be in tune with them and utilize them for your own success. like stare like terrifying slash staring at the void it's like okay i got this loan i got i i, I cashed in my my 401k like that i was gonna like quote unquote oh, we're retire all in, on. baby yeah it's, it's like it's all in like this is either gonna work or it's not <laughs> haven't worked at a casino we're definitely gambling yeah, it's, it's, we are it's all, all in. in um was do you think that like that go like do you think that that's necessary for each and every business or is that more of a situational thing for you because like it might as well go all in and, and let the chips fall where they may uh, i think it's a situational thing um i'm just i was not born with a silver spoon um all of those wonderful jobs that i've been laid off from and all that good stuff i've just been i've been saving and so just trying to stack that as best as i could to get to there that's how I did it. And the reason why I ask it, it's funny that you, you work for a casino. Like, how many casinos? And I've heard horror stories where like certain casinos never even get built because they take, like, 80 loans from 80 different banks. Mm. And, like, you know, here's some the stuff. I think it was, um, it was like, Kevin Smith, when he, when he did the movie Clerks, like, he maxed out, like, 12 different credit cards, like, destroyed his credit. So, like, there's different ways to go about it. So, I'm guessing, oh, like... Have you seen Restaurant Nightmares? Yeah. You could yeah, always yeah. catch an owner who's like, yeah. I maxed out all my cards. Yeah. My house is up. My this is up. My, everything i'm all in like my house is online too so so you went all in and that was the way that was the way you funded it how to do it and then speaking of that also in kickstarter yeah because i remember contributing the kickstarter and i was like this is kind of cool but like what made you think like yeah kickstarter like might as well give that a shot like well initially i wasn't gonna do it um i felt like doing the kickstarter was a good way to sort of build some anticipation for kin for one Again, to be vulnerable, which I feel like is necessary for this process. Um, and, and I'm sitting here, you're watching the news, you're seeing all these restaurants going under. I'm like, you're going to need some backup cash. You're going to need cash flow in order to keep that business afloat. I mean, cash is like oxygen when it comes to business. 
Yes. If you find some just laying somewhere, you want to slide it? Let me know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, in what better way to get my community involved than to put this Kickstarter out there and let people, you know, get their piece of skin too and build it. And it's interesting, like how... And I'm wondering, like, did you realize that in the beginning, like, hey, it built community, but did you think it was going to be possibly a tool for brand building? Or do you think that that was just more of like a happy accident? Like, hey, I'm going to put this out there. And like, what was the what was the initial reaction when you put the Kickstarter out there? Like, were you surprised? Were you like, holy shit? I would like to say that I'm a marketing genius, um, but I'm not. And I didn't think it was going to be as well received as possible. I mean, honestly, someone told me, was like, all right, most Kickstarters especially out of Rhode Island, have not been successful. So good luck. Hopefully you just get your name out there. Yeah, you're just like, all right, it, it, like people, like I'll post about it and then people will know about it, but there was no expectation of like, None. there's no like money goal or something. Like, I need to get X amount from the Kickstarter or anything. No, like okay. luckily I'd already had like the loan. I had already put my, my percentage in. So I was like, if we get this, that's super. That's exactly what will really help us be stable. It was a nice to have, but not a need to have. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. And so I had to look at it that way because of the likelihood of the Kickstarter actually kicking off. So what was the reception like? I'm. We made our goal. I'm was that still like a surprised. Holy shit moment it was a like, holy what, shit. What I was like, all right, so we got a couple thousand going. That's wonderful. All right. Okay. It looks. Oh shit. We might actually hit this thing. Okay. I really just need to push a little bit more. We're actually gonna get this thing. So. It was it was definitely a surprise to me. I was so grateful to everybody who contributed. We still have people who are coming and are like, I got my biscuit coupon. I'm here for my biscuits. And I'm like, thank you for your contribution. Yeah, I, you have no idea how I saw that. I well, that's the that's um kind of giving a little behind the scenes about the show. I saw as I was starting this podcast, I saw you were doing that. And I'm like, all right, let me like just contribute and do like the postcard thing just to because I'm like but I'm like, this is an interesting story. Like, I don't see many restaurants, like, opening on Kickstarter. You don't. And then I was like, this is kind of cool. Like, all right. Like, let me – like, let me give let me give some money. I got the postcard, the, the handwritten thank you note, which was, like – in this time of digital everything and uh, somebody worked in tech, like, to see mm-hmm. a handwritten note was, like, amazing. I'm um, old school. I yeah. got that from the Boston CVB. That's so another life that, lesson that, that right personal, there. That personal touch you gotta. Made, made me feel connected. And not, and that's when I like initially reached out. And now we're, and now we're here doing the episode. Um, you know, because you were talking about emotional catalysts for this business. What were the emotions like when you hit the goal? Especially being <sighs> told that like Rhode Island Kickstarters and even just restaurant Kickstarters in general are usually not a thing. Like what was that emotion like? Um, shock and awe, <laughs> um, just grateful and surprised. I was like, all right, well, I mean, I actually got to, I actually got to get this stuff. <laughs> like, it's like, I actually have to get these time. shirts. It's go time. Like we got to kick it into overdrive. Plus we're still trying to open at the same time, but I wanted to make sure that everybody got their stuff in a timely manner. So I was like working on opening, working on Juneteenth permits and, so and wrapping up shirts, send them up. So speaking of that, you're working on. Uh, we are working on opening. You're getting the funding going, mm-hmm. right? And um, in a very, this is a very. All right. So anybody who's listening outside of like Providence and or Rhode Island, I'm going to say a very Rhode Island thing. And um, for anybody who lives in Rhode Island or lives in Providence, they're going to understand what they exactly what I'm saying. For anybody outside, it's a thing Rhode Islanders say where it's like if you need to find how to like how to get to somewhere and you're talking to somebody local, it's like. Oh, it's it's where the dot 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 used to be, across from the Dunkin' Donuts, or across from the Dun- or it, 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 yeah, <laughs> either Dunkin' Donuts is a landmark, which There's that's a whole many. other that's a whole other story. There's yeah, I I've actually literally seen a Dunkin' Donuts across from another Dunkin' Donuts. It's gotten to that. There's point too of, many and still yet not enough. Yeah, I mean, I'll beg to differ on that because I can't. I I like local coffee more than Dunkin' Donuts, but that's a whole other story. That's a story. That's yeah. We, we'll talk about that after. Um, but. <laughs> The reason why I said that it's it's where the dot 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 used to be, other than I'm turning into my dad, which is both great and terrifying at the same time. Embrace it. Yep. I, I mean, he he did have a head. He still has a full head of hair at 78. And Ow. so Yeah. So I mean, I'm not gonna have to lose any hair, which is great. But the reason why I say that is because the um, where Kin is that we're physically sitting in 
used to be a restaurant called Redfin, yeah. which I have been I, to. Yes, and coincidentally, right across from a Dunkin' Donuts. That too. <laughs> so it's, it's very Rhode Island. Um, and so the reason why I ask is what made you choose this location? Yeah. Well, during the, uh, during the shutdown when you're supposed to be inside, um, I was outside driving around Providence looking for spaces. Um, I think I saw this space, I want to say in July, and then I just kept, I saw a couple spaces actually. I went and saw the uh, Friendlies over on Mineral Spring Avenue in North Providence. Um, like that's still there. As, oh. as somebody who grew up in North Providence and the fact that there's nothing, there's nothing there, like, Mm-mm. I feel like that would have been a double-edged sort of like, oh, cool. Yeah, there's actually something great to go to, but at the same time, it's like a bear. And if anybody in North Providence wants to disagree or like throw some hate at me, fine. But like, you have to you climb a mountain admit, to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's like one of those, like, there's nothing there. So, so that's interesting that you were looking at that spot. So I looked at that space. Um... I looked at what was Pizza Queen over in Smith, and then I saw this space. And initially, I didn't li- I didn't really like it. Um, my mom kind of persuaded me. She's like, "This space is way better. You should go with this one. This is the one." I said, "Why, mom?" She's like, "Location, location, location. Day one of marketing class. Foot traffic. Foot traffic. It's downtown." And then I started thinking about it, and I'm like, "If we're doing this as a safe space for everybody." We want it to be an inclusive location, which is easy to access for anyone, no matter what community you're coming from. You can catch Uncle Ripta to come down here if you really want to. So this is kind of why I landed on the space. Plus, I felt like we have the bar area, and being the event girl that I am, if you wanted to do a private event in this back dining room, it's easy to do so. You can easily do something semi-private if you wanted to. In the Red Fin days, I had a couple of birthdays back here, so hopefully my next birthday I'll be doing one back here at K. Hey, turn up, turn yeah. up. And, and also with the, the amount of space, it means I can invite as many people as possible. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I think I'm about to come, you know, I'm a, I'm a May baby, I'm a Taurus baby, so okay. man, come, come May, I may have to hit you up. Come on down. Well, I think the other reason why I like this space is that... Um, I could easily see it being transformed with minimal sort of, you know, decorating and stuff like that. That was going to be my next question because as somebody who had visited the former establishment, yeah. right? and Redfin was a, I mean, like on the surface, I'm not going to say I know what their books were like or anything like that, but it was a good establishment. And the fact that it closed is a shame. And the silver lining is that you're here and now it's, Something it's something new. Er, I want to say new because you've been open for a, for a bit. Yeah. But um, you know they were, for all intents and purposes, a good restaurant. Yeah. And they failed, and 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 not maybe like not in the sense of like they are failed, but like the restaurant is no longer here. Yeah. Right. So like that is an L. Um, the reason why I say that is that you saw that this space was open, and. Were you aware that there was another restaurant here? And like, was that an intimidating factor? It's like, oh, this, this other place that was here came and went. And now I, I'm going to be Unfortunately, on a new mission. Or I mean, as soon as I told anybody I wanted to open a restaurant, they're like, you know, the failure, the, po- the potential of fail is the failure rate and all that kind of stuff. It's extremely high. It's the first thing out of someone's mouth. And the, and the profit like, margins being thin and all that. Yeah, thank you for the reminder. I appreciate that. I'm still going to keep going. Um, <laughs> um, but no, I think, yeah, I just really saw a lot of opportunity for the space. Um, it kind of grew on me and it, it was kind of fun to like work with, um, actually one of the local sort of designers, um, Libby came out and gave me some good pointers about how we could make the space feel more, you know, with our more in line with our concept of Southern comfort. Um, and so that really helped and kind of just took it and ran with it. And for a lot of the, um, the vendors that we worked with before open, my goal was to work with as many um, minority owned businesses and women owned businesses. And I felt like they really just sort of jumped on the concept and really embraced it and embraced me and were very encouraging throughout. 
So I was just really grateful for them. What were what were some of those before diving into like the DNA of Ken? Because yeah. that's that's a part I definitely want to get into. But what were some of those um, changes that you need to make as far as just making it making it feel like like your brand and what you were doing uh, versus like what you walked into? Was there like a lot of things you had to rehab? Were there like unexpected things that you had to rehab? They're like, oh, I didn't expect I was going to be like doing X, Y, and Z. Well, you know, we had to design the whole kitchen. There was no equipment in there. No. Oh, wow. There was a sink. The hand washing sink. I think that's the same thing. And then from the bar, we have one cooler that's left over from there. Everything else we had to replace. And luckily, because of my SBA loan with uh, the CIC, a lot of that budget was built in to go towards equipment. So that was helpful. But a lot of this is just some paint, some elbow work, and some really nice upholstery from Patuket. And so... That paint and that elbow work, was that you and your first staff or was, or was that like people no. that you were hiring? That Contractor. You were, so I was con- How were you going about getting those contracts? Were, were, like, were there certain ones you wanted to work with or yes. was it more just like... Family friends. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. Gotta. I'm a Rhode Islander. That's me. Nepotis- goes, nepotism in yeah, Rhode Island just hit up who you know. You hit up who you know. So my dad get him down here and start putting some tables together. My head chef helped put chairs and tables together. I did. My mama was in here painting stuff. Sorority sisters helping paint. Anybody and everybody was willing to lend a hand. Come on down. Wear your mask. Let's do it. <laughs> so I want to get into the DNA of Kin. So actually, first off, why the name Kin? What made you land on that? I feel like I, I say this pretty much very, like, to everybody. But when I was writing the proposal, I'm like... And I was thinking, a lot of the time I was thinking about, like, family barbecues and stuff like that. That's usually where we had, like, the most fun. It was, like, everybody bringing their dishes and stuff like that. I was like, I want that kind of feel when you come here. I want you to feel like you're part of, you're at the family barbecue, essentially. I want you to feel like you got invited. That's, like, the, that's like the best. That is the it's best. Like, that's high know, praise but, you get invited to the family barbecue. Well, that and also, if you're, like, it's those best times you get, like, you get invited to, like, a friend's family party. And then you get to, like see and taste and experience like that food and that culture. Their culture, and go, exactly. And, you know? That's exactly what I wanted. That's why we have a cocktail on, <laughs> on the menu called Auntie's Kool-Aid because there's always that one, like Auntie who comes and spikes it and gets a little loose. My, my favorite, and um, I'm saying this with my confidence in my masculinity, is the Black Girl Magic. Oh, that cocktail's delicious. I also love like the, it looks like a, it looks like a magical galaxy when I looked at it. And being the <laughs> sci-fi nerd that I am, I'm like, glitter. wow. I'm like, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you know what? Never. I like, it's the only time where like a glittery kind of cocktail where I'm just like, no, I want that. I, I saw it walk by and I'm like, no, I'm getting that. I don't... Yeah. You'd be surprised yeah. the guy's reactions when they're just... like, I want, they want to say, it. you gotta say it. Say it with your chest. I would like a black girl magic. Piece. Oh, I. Well, I, I looked at I looked at the girls around. I'm like, is that a black girl magic? She's like, yeah. I'm like, I want one now. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yes, mm-hmm. one of those. I. Please and yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any um any any guy wants to get at me for that, whatever. I am I am confident in my masculinity. I've right. had some guys come up to me like, all right, where's the black boy joint cocktail? When is that coming out? Never. <laughs> when I feel like there it. There you go. Because I'm the woman in charge. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the buck stops with you right so you decide when, the, when that cocktail comes along or if it doesn't when she says so there you go funny funny enough that's my dad's advice for a happy marriage is, right is, 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 listen to the lady happy, in charge happy happy wife happy life it's like so dad how do you make decisions like whenever your mom says so. i'm like all right good good to know right good marriage advice. quicker you figure that out <laughs> better off we'll all be so you had this like really good idea of a, of a mission statement of making wanting to make everybody feel welcome, yeah. feel like they're at the family barbecue, mm-hmm. right? So you're writing that down, you put out the intention. Um, it's one thing to have that idea, right? Yeah. What was the work, whether it was in the visuals, the marketing, the branding, the logo, the how you styled things? Like, how do you take that idea, like a concept that's like a bit of an intangible, mm-hmm. right? And how do you make that tangible? Like, what were steps that you did or what were things that you came up with to make this intangible idea tangible? Well, 
There is only so much you can. I really, initially, I really wanted to have large communal tables, but because of COVID, you can only do, oh, you can only do so much. Um, so we ended up doing all these lovely tables that you can easily slide together to encourage togetherness. Um, but we also have like these, like our, our booth over there right across from the kitchen. I feel like that encourages like that family feel because you could at least put six, seven, eight people over there in that corner. You have the other bench over here where you can sort of put six, seven, eight people. We really wanted to be able to group people together when they wanted to be together, when it's safe to be together. Um, I don't know. There's just other small touches that I felt like. Like one I'm looking at right now. And, what you looking at? And, I, and, I've, and it's actually what drew my eye to this place. Is, is it the, the, is the, the, the artwork the, in the front? It's the, if, the, if, it, if it doesn't, if the love doesn't feel like 90s r and B, I I don't want it. I want to know who I that don't. artist is because I want a print of that. I want to frame it and put it in Listen, my, and put it in my so apartment. All of the artwork I found online, disclaimer, full disclaimer, full disclosure, um, but I, I spent months trying to find like the perfect pieces and I felt like as soon as I saw that, I was like, gosh, damn it. Like, that's what we had at the barbecue. Like, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking back to the nineties when like my great grandmother was still alive and my aunt Bertie was still alive and we would have those barbecues. So that's just right up the alley. I'm going to cry again. It's going to happen. Most emotional episode. I'm of the sorry. Capital I should have no, warned you. No, I cry a lot. No, no. I, I mean, I mean that as a positive. I was, I was like, because sometimes it gets into like dry businessy talk, which is important because that that's where some of the cheat codes are. And I'm trying to help out with, with, <laughs> with those things, but but the fact that like this, there there is this sense of emotion and, and vulnerability within this business as I was doing the research for this episode, and so how much from that idea of family and together, like how meticulous would you get or how much of yourself and your emotion would you put into things like choosing the artwork or things like, hey, here's here's how the layout's going to be. Here's how the branding is going to look like. I can't how pick. much did you do on your own? And like, I have to do this or versus like, how much did you trade off? Like, There's a tough thing too. And it's like, the business represents you, but you can't do every little thing. When it comes to like the look and a lot of the pl- Everything down for like the plates, the I handpicked a lot of it. There's a lot of stuff that's here that was um, untouched from um, Redfin, like a couple of the light fixtures and things like that. But we re- replaced the others. Um, for the most part, I've I touched everything in this building. Everything, yeah. like down to the plates, the forks, the what color napkins we use. Uh, mason jars for water glasses, everything, salt and pepper shakers. So everything's got your fingerprints in your DNA. All of it, which is why I'm so emotional, which is why I cry so damn much during the first few months. It's like, oh, all of these ideas that were just on giant post-its, it's turned into four walls and forks and knives and spoons. That we're sitting in. And that's like that's like some tears of joy shit right there. Yeah. That's the that's and that's, people that work here and bodies that come in and interact and have that's family the happy moments ending of the movie and have yeah people have like engage after engagement parties and all sorts of stuff. That's exactly why we did this. This is what you live for in the event industry: people being together, having fun, and you seem to have a good time and enjoying. Right what until you've it's built. too late, and I want to kick them out. But yeah, other than that, yeah. <laughs> All right, note to self: Do I not stay after closing time. No, you can. You can. <laughs> You'll see it on my face. Like, okay. All right, I'm about to fall asleep in a corner. Pray for me. But otherwise, <laughs> please, Kiki, do what you gotta do. So speaking of that, what you know, tying back to those food memories and those that family food history, right? Yeah. Um, the recipes, how did you pick and choose, or was it just like, hey, let's do all of them? How did you pick and choose what recipes made it onto the menu? Well, the original menu was extremely long. Um, and then I realized other restaurants during COVID were cutting back and it made sense too. Um, especially when we weren't sure. We had a very small staff. We were trying to get ready for opening. When you're opening any sort of business, just like we did with the casino, time for training sometimes is very small. Sometimes it's a lot. And for this, I felt like the night before I decided, I was like, I don't think we're ready. 
So I was with uh, one of my good friends, Jerry Finch, and he came over to my house at like two o'clock in the morning. And we were like, yeah, that full menu that you printed and got really cute from Staples, that thing isn't going to work tomorrow. We're going to fall flat on our face if we don't cut some stuff and keep it simple and keep people happy. Um, so what we ended up doing is coming up with a condensed menu that included the staples, the main staples, the stuff that needed to be at the barbecue. Like if you show up tomorrow, if I invite you to a barbecue next week, a lot of this stuff is gonna have to be there. Otherwise, my auntie's gonna flip a table. She's gonna be real mad. Like I can't not have baked mac and cheese at the barbecue. People will be mad. So that's kind of how we decided on which, which dishes to go with. And was there any, and the reason why I asked is because I seem to have, especially with like every, every, every other day there's a new viral trend, but there was a time in like, I want to say it's like the time has passed, but there was like, there was like a, a couple of years where like I feel every other week there was a new food trend. Like, hey, here's the ramen grilled cheese sandwich thing, or like the cronut, or the this, mm -hmm. or that. Um, and some people they like to put a new spin on things, like our traditional thing, and you get like you know remix culture and stuff like that, and like it turns into something new and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a fad. Sometimes it's just plain horrible. Um, <laughs> I've experienced all of them. Uh, when it came to those recipes, was it more like, hey, we have to stick strictly to the recipe. We're not going to try and update anything. Or was it more like, hey, these recipes are like guidelines and we can update some stuff. Like how, how did that go about? I think it was definitely guidelines. Um, I think it was just sort of what felt right too, because we're okay. all about emotions in here. Um, but I think it also came, I think, yeah, we just had to have certain, there just had to be certain things. But when it came to recipes, yeah, there was, we just used them as guidelines. But I know that there was, as long as it fit within the brand. So like I kept, the staff will ask me all the time, like, Julie, can we have a burger on the menu? I'm like, it's not really soul food. I'm, I'm they like, no, I'm like, I can't, I just can't. One day, maybe. When we start brunch, maybe, but it's pushing it. I just wanted to make sure that it stuck to what was traditionally a soul food dish, kind of. And then, you so know. So you're willing to make modifications, but it still has to fall in that, like, soul food guideline. Kind of. Like yeah. our fried chicken sandwich, I feel like that's kind of a little deviation from soul food, but it's still got our fried and thick slab bacon and obey and all that good yumminess. It's small deviation, but it's still, there's soul food parts in there. Got me hungry now. It's got some soul parts. <laughs> soul Soulful parts. parts. It's, it's, a, it's, a soul, it's a soul remix. Mm -hmm. Not to ignition, but just the remix. Because <laughs> that's not okay. I, I, wow. All right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Before getting into the, like, and I want to dive into this, the logistical like restaurant specific questions and business specific questions. Um, was there a specific moment or moments and what, maybe it was opening day where <coughs> it was like, Oh, this is real now. Like this is a real business. This is like, this is a thing. This is not just an idea anymore. This is not something on paper. This is, this is, this is like, Holy crap. This is, this is happening. Was there like uh, things leading up to, or was it just one event? No, it was a series of crying um, for the first two months. And then it still randomly hits me every now and then, too. That's but, like, oh, wow. This like, is oh, this shit. Is yeah. It usually hits me around when we got to pay the rent. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, that's I, right. that, That's going to be a quote for a social media post. Like, oh, what was it real for when we have to pay the rent? Right. Got it. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, this isn't just... I was telling, like, I was talking to the staff the other day. I was like, sometimes I just feel like I'm a kid again and we're just playing pretend. Like, we're, let's dress up and pretend like we're, like we're waiters and bartenders. No, this is like the real thing. It's the real thing. So getting into the industry related questions and I'm going to, I've been making a habit of this because I want people to listen to more episodes of the show. Um, as they should. As they should. So 
Jen of the Eddie mm-hmm. and Dirk's Barbecue. Yeah. Great, great guest. Go listen to that episode. Not, not during this one. Like, listen to this one first, then go back and listen to, to that episode. And then if you want to listen to this one again to get context, gets me double the listens, and then you get a better context. You know, that – so feel free to do that whole thing. But – I remember talking to talking to Jen and one thing she was stating about the bar versus like, so like a bar versus a restaurant was like the profit margins on like drinks and cocktails versus, versus uh, something like, um, like a burger or a sandwich or even mm-hmm. like, uh, like a, an appetizer or an entree and people's perception of, of cost. Mm. Meaning that like, and, and she made a good point of how like, you know, Somebody being charged fourteen dollars for a cocktail, <laughs> and they don't flip out about it. No, right? Like that's fine, and the profit margin's crazy. But then if you charge, you know what you really, what you know in her, in her words, like what you should be charging for a burger, especially or or a sandwich that's using like fresh, locally made ingredients and right. things of that nature, they like they lose their shit sometimes, or uh, or yeah. they think it, or they think it's too expensive. What and because you have both, you know these recipes that have been handed down and, you know, soul food and the drinks. So you see in both ends of it. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think that that perception, like, oh, like, yeah, like $14 for a cocktail. Great. Then it's like, hey, we're going to charge you like X amount of dollars for this chicken sandwich. What? Like, God. Like, yeah. I think, especially what's, when it comes to soul food, I think that for a long time, um, soul food, you can easily... Well, not, maybe not easily, but typically, if you were looking for soul food, you'd probably find it at a takeout restaurant, takeout spot. So maybe you'd spend maybe ten dollars for a plate, twelve maybe, bucks. Maybe something like I don't know about now, but like maybe like Bucktown, because like, that was a takeout spot even before Bucktown came. Right. In. Like maybe something like in a location like that. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. I don't, I felt like for a few months I was like, oh well, it's gonna take people some time to get used to like paying. For 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 like a actual meal, for like a meal where you're an experience actually, yeah. you're paying for the experience as well for, to some extent. But food today it's extremely expensive. I had someone reach out to me um, about doing a cater event. No names, of course. They said essentially they wanted some plates for about fifty. We'll say fifty people. Is that what's your budget? Well, like $10 a person. So if you're paying $10 a person for food, and normally I don't have anything other than maybe an app or a side. Yeah. That costs $10. Um, you have to look at like our food costs, our food. Let's say that means if you're telling me $10, then I can probably only spend maybe two and a half dollars of cost to make that $10 meal for you in order to like, pay for our rent, our staff, our, even the paper goods are up. Even recyclable paper goods, paper bag, the takeout utensils, the packets of ketchup. My old boss from the casino would be like, people don't understand how, what it takes to put fries on the plate. And you, and it completely agree. What oil are you putting in that, in that fryer? Where'd the fryer come from? How much is the fryer? How much does it cost to keep the fryer running? How much does it cost for the person frying the fries? Who picked the plate? Um, napkins. Where Can are you getting the napkins from? It I'm, all, it I'm all glad costs. you're bringing this up because it leads so perfectly. So can you break down from like end to end as much as you want to reveal? It's up to you of like you were saying like that chicken sandwich you have on the menu, right? Yeah. So let's use that as an example. Can you break down – everything end to end that goes into the cost of that chicken sandwich, like when it gets to you, when it gets to the person and then why, like, and when I say why, like, Hey, we, we, we source this chicken from this farm. Like, okay, why that farm? Like, could you break that down for us? Like, if you want to like walk us through that. But even, I think part of that too, I'll do the breakdown. Oh yeah. Yeah. But on top of that is you also have to look at the effort it takes to make it. And by effort, too, I mean yeah. the cost of labor. Right. Which, I mean, what's, uh, what is it? Minimum wage right now is twelve twenty-five. I don't pay my cooks twelve twenty-five. 
They get paid above twelve twenty-five. It's gonna lead in my next question after the breakdown. They get paid but above twelve twenty-five. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad they we're not touching on it right now. They would not show up for twelve twenty-five. They would tell me to kiss their butt for twelve twenty-five. Um, but you looked all right. So we got a bun. We have obey mayo. So we're making our. We have mayo. We're adding obey. Obey is not cheap, especially the way we use it so loosely. <laughs> um, you have your chicken breast, um, flour all the different spices that go into covering that, buttermilk, um, let's see, cheddar cheese, cheddar cheese, definitely not cheap, especially when you gotta slice it, cheddar cheese, slab bacon, our slab bacon alone, let's see, a slice of our slab bacon is probably a good 25 cents. And, and this, that cheese, that, that bun, is that all coming from like local bakeries and local dairy spots or? Oh, we use U.S. Foods or okay. we'll go to Restaurant Depot. Gotcha. Um, and then, yeah, the process of actually preparing it, our French fries, we hand cut our French fries every day. So there's someone in the back with their arm cranking that thing. <laughs> and essentially with each order, you're practically getting a, a whole potato, you know, half. It's hand cut fries. It's hand cut fries. And then, you know, salt, pepper, garlic, all that good stuff that costs money too. Even like a five pound container of garlic is like 30 bucks, 40 bucks. Do you think it's a perception issue? Because there was another thing that um, Jen had mentioned in an episode that was actually like, it was a good line. It was pretty eye opening where she said, hey, like on a given Friday or Saturday night, you can follow the Cisco truck. And meaning like the Cisco, like if anybody doesn't like know, there's there's, two, there's Cisco, the IT company, not talking about them. Mm -hmm. And then there's Cisco, the food, like products, SCI, food, SCI. Ser yeah, food, food service products company. And, you know, but what was interesting is like, Jen was like, hey, you could follow that truck around. But that Cisco truck goes to some like smaller mom and pop shops. They go to some touristy spots, right? But then they go to some high end spots. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it's all this, you know, and, and like for anybody that's using it, it's all coming from, like, they're going to make their variations and do what they do, obviously, right. as individual restaurants. It's coming from the same place. So do you think that there's, do you think it's like a perception issue sometimes when it comes to, like, the diner or, like, the perception that the restaurant's putting out there versus, like, what's actually going on? Um, I think it is a perception issue. I think part of it is that you have, um, you know, the fast food industry, which has a dang on dollar menu. I don't understand how you can make something that is, as tasty as my chicken sandwich for a dollar. You just can't do it. You can't. It's just not possible. Essentially, I'd be giving away chicken sandwiches. Um, but even just looking at chicken wings since we opened, I think for a 40 pound case of chicken wings, which we'll probably get, it's 40 pounds. It's 100 and, started out $120. It's up to like $140. And I sell chicken. That's what I sell. It's already jumped. And so when you get like eight wings on a plate, that's practically jumbo wings, it's a pound. So yeah, that costs money. And so covering them, the labor to cover them, buying more plates because the staff breaks plates. <laughs> we got to put it on a plate for you. Got to do something. Napkins, hot sauce, all that good stuff. It it costs. And so when it comes down to margins and people thinking that we're taking home tons of money at the end of the day, if you're lucky, you're getting, you'd be happy with, you know, you'd be extremely happy if you had a margin of 20%, but that's not the case. That's The costs no one can see and no one can calculate. Throughout a number of episodes on this show, the topic of cost when starting a business has been discussed many times. Startup costs, maintenance costs, cost to find or create inventory, legal costs, licensing costs, and so on and so on. But one cost that really hadn't been covered until now is the hidden personal costs that are associated when starting a business. Julia described how starting a business, while exciting, can also be terrifying, especially even more so when you go all in, both personally and financially. The willingness to be vulnerable to describe your business idea on Kickstarter 
and then waiting to see how the public responds, if at all. Being nimble and quick enough to react and respond to surprises. And finally, the blood, sweat, and tears, and the physical and emotional toll that starting a business takes on a person. So when starting your own business, be aware of all of your costs, especially the personal ones. Uh, Costs are high. Before we get into the, the staff part, because I'm glad you mentioned it. Actually, you know, let's go into the staff part right now, because I think it's so. I had two staff-related questions. Mm-hmm. One, so you did have some experience of like hiring people, right? Oh yes. Yeah. So you had that experience. Sorry, Barbara. And you weren't. Hey, no, it wasn't your fault. It was. It was your. It was buddy. Michael Fishman. Yeah, it was Michael. Michael, that that P, it's SOB. Mm-hmm. Um, so you had some experience in hiring people, but was it still like? Did it mess with you that it's like, oh, wait, I got to go like find talent and like hire them and train them or develop them or hire somebody else to train them and develop them to like make this place run because I can't do every little thing. Yeah. And Uh, what was that like? Just like what was that kind of like, oh, crap, I got to like find people and make sure they're a good fit. Yeah. And what was was your criteria for that opening staff? Like what did they have to know and like what kind of personality they have to have? Well, um course uh started with Maya Jeff um we actually worked together at the casino so he was one of the cooks there and I'm not gonna lie I was not the friendliest to him when I worked there I was a bully (laughs) so the fact that he's been working for me for this long completely turned me around um but no um just really trying to interact with people that I knew to see if they had any referrals um, and then indeed.com posting jobs there, posting on Craigslist, lots of, um, just lots of talking to people in the community, posting. I post everywhere. We had a, one point we had an open house and tried to get as many people in here and actually you'd be surprised of how many people are somewhat we kind of knew each other before they worked here because that's kind of how we were able to staff this place. It was, oh, you're hired. Do you know anybody? Oh, actually, I do. They can come on in. Let me meet them. If you're speaking for them and they're all right, they got a job. And the second part of that question, so you're finding, you're finding the staff, right? But you were making that statement before of like, hey, minimum wage is this. Right? Yeah, but it just went up. <laughs> and there's, but there's no way that I'm paying my staff back because they're going to tell me bye. Right. Right. And so the reason why I want to reference that is that this question of you see, and I've seen it on the news and I've seen it on social media where you got certain restaurants of certain sizes, big and small, chains, non-chains, mm-hmm. fast, casual, whatever the heck that means nowadays, uh, fast food, or even independent restaurants. And you're seeing owners and managers certain ones not all of them complain of oh nobody wants to work or if i I have to pay these people what they want then like my business is going to go out of business and Mm -hmm. then they like and then or they shut the business down and they say oh it's because i can't find staff want to work for this and i can't pay the amount of money that people want um and you know so i have to shut it down and and, like they're they're blaming all these other things right yeah and then but then if that was the case then you would think almost every restaurant would just be out of business. Mm. And that's not the case either. We're, we're sitting in a restaurant right now, your restaurant, that's not out of business. Trying. Uh, <laughs> do you, do you think that that's a cop out? Do you think it's just, it's maybe they weren't do like maybe they weren't paying, you know, I know it's hard to speak on like other people's businesses and stuff, but it just seems like, why is it that some are like, yeah, I, I can't keep running this be, um, because, you know, X, Y, and Z. And then you see other restaurants that are like, yeah, like we're able to pay higher wages and like we survive and we're able to be nimble and like exist and dot, dot, dot. Do you think it's, what do you think that is? Because it, it seems like either like the whole story is, isn't there when, it, when it's like, oh, I can't hire cooks this or nobody wants to work. It's like, well, maybe they just don't want to work for you. And maybe there's something about you that... Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's think, you, man. Like, maybe it's not. <laughs> I definitely think it's a mix. It's so hard right now. I think um, looking back when everybody was, well, personally, when I was on unemployment and getting the extra, 
couple hundred bucks a week. I was making good money. I was making better money than I'm paying myself to work here. Um, and I feel like for a certain time period, um, people, I would, some people, I would say, got comfortable um, getting that extra amount and not having to work for it. Um, and then I think, you know, there comes a time where you're like, all right, we're not getting that money from the government. I actually have to go to work. Um, I want to be paid just as well as is getting paid for not doing anything. And I think a lot of it also depends on the people. It depends on the people that you hire. Um, I've been really lucky enough to have a staff from the beginning that uh, that uh, believed in what we were trying to accomplish here. Um, and to a certain extent, I think, you know, when you're putting things on paper, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to pay my staff X, Y, Z. I was like, oh, yeah, sure. People don't mind like a dollar or two over minimum wage. No, people want more. People want a living wage. And I know as a small business owner who's just starting out, Sometimes that's hard to be able to afford, especially when you have slow months like January, where we had to, like even a couple of weeks ago, we had to close on a Saturday night, which is usually when we would be busy. Losing out on a Saturday night because of weather and on top of it because of COVID, because people are scared to come out, it's hard. So like watching your your budget um, is something that's like constantly on my mind. So like, I get it. I get it from both sides. Employees deserve to be paid a good wage for when they're working hard, when they're, you know, they're in the grind, they're toughing it out, they're producing quality stuff for us. And to the other extent, yeah, it's hard to be able to afford to pay someone that amount if maybe if they're not contributing. Um, it's a toss. But yeah, just try to be a flexible boss, I guess. And I feel like to a certain extent, um, my staff somewhat respects me <laughs> uh, <clears throat> as much as they possibly can or feel like it. Um, but yeah, I, I can see both sides. It's, it is hard though. There's no clear cut answer for that. So speaking of being the boss and Ugh. staff and contributions, hate being the boss. how, how much of the decision making is purely you meaning like hey, this, this new f- food item is going to go on the menu. Like you were saying, like how your staff wanted a burger and you're like, nah, not, at least not at this time. Yeah, if I think um, that. Versus like the types of spirits you carry at the bar. Because like I've noticed, and I, I think this is interesting about, about your place, is that a lot of, I'll, I'll put out that like Southern style because like, bro- I'll, I'll use a broader term, mm-hmm. restaurants, we're really focused in on the heavy on like the bourbon and the whiskey. Yeah. Which there's a logic to it. I get it. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed yours is less rum. on that and more on the rum. Yes. Um, so, you know, is that a decision that, like, that's purely, purely you? Is that, like, a collaborative staff decision? Like, how much do you um, micromanage? Like, how much is, like, oh, every little decision? Oh, I'm definitely So you're a micromanager. All right. However, um, my staff is very... Um, they know that they can bring any sort of idea to me, and I feel like they do. Um, just the other day, we were working on all of our Valentine's Day cocktails. I said, you guys come up with it. I'll try it. If I like it, we'll roll with it. Um, but for us to be a rum bar, that was kind of me. I think initially when we opened, I felt like, oh, yeah, when you think Southern, people think whiskey. But again, talking about where I wanted to be with vendors and stuff like that, I was thinking um, minority-owned businesses, which, you know, which kind of leads to, like, being part of the African diaspora, and then uh, women-owned businesses. So when I think... Side question, sorry. Is that how you choose the vendors you work with? Like, besides, because, like, besides your staff and besides, like, food people, like, Mm -hmm. there's got to be vendors you work with, and that's a different process for everybody on what vendors you choose. Yeah, I think I give priority to those, to those two groups. Um, so I wanted to go with rum because most of the rum is from Caribbean islands. There are people that look like me. 
And that's what I wanted to support. I think it's even crazier. Like, I started getting into rum, but I've never been a rum drinker up until recently. And there's Ooh, like, come rum, get you some. There's like rum barbin court, which is like, oh, yeah, it's from thing. Haiti. Yeah, and that because, stuff's delicious. Because they use the sugar cane and it's not molasses. And then, like, mm-hmm. and then there's like these like British Navy privateer style rums that are like dumb strong. Like, you know, right. like, like, that's a whole other like subgenre of a genre and things exactly. of that nature. Um, so I thought, yeah, like that was a really, so that was a you decision. That was like, hey, I want to do this. Instead I of- wanted us to be a little bit different. Well, we're all, we're different. I just wanted us to be different. I feel like rum is a little underrated um, and it deserves its shine. It really does. I think there are some rums that are out there that you can sip slow and enjoy like a, like a cognac. And there's other that. ones that you can just chug a lug, like, you know, like Bacardi and stuff. I actually had somebody make a, a cocktail with Bacardi, and it was actually good. And I looked at them, and I just went, "You know what? You, Give, you, you." Put some respect on her no, name. No, I was, I was like, "You are a hell of a bartender if you were able to make a cocktail and it had it was Bacardi based." Well, our, and I was like, "Damn, our, okay." Our Juju Juice cocktail, which is named after, well, it's my nickname, um, is made with Bacardi. So it's Bacardi coconut, Bacardi black, pineapple mango juice. Uh, some grenadine, some lime. It's our house rum punch. We may have to do a shot of rum together after. Uh, <laughs> God, like, Jesus. I love rum. And then we definitely have like our local rum producers. So I also wanted to do local. So local is definitely a part of it too when it came to vendors. So you have your micromanaging style and your fingerprints on those things. <laughs> yes. and, and the reason why I want to say that is because like, there's an advantage to that, but then there's also like, does it ever get to the point where it's like, I'm tired of making decisions. Yeah. And it's like, and have you handed off anything? And then was that a hard decision of like, and how do you go about choosing what you're going to hand off versus what you're not going to hand off to somebody else? So there's like a trust mm. thing there. It's like, Hey, this business is my baby, but realistically you're going to get burned out of somebody if you try to do every little decision. You can't be everywhere at once. So yeah. how do you like, have you handed anything off or have you not? Has it been difficult? Mm. It's so I'm a work in progress. I'm not going to lie. Um, we all are. Yeah, definitely working on trying to um, unload some of my responsibilities. So I do have a beverage supervisor. I really lean into my team, especially when it comes to like the cocktails. We I created the initial cocktail list, but we've definitely had some specials and stuff like that that we've incorporated. Um, and probably going to be switching out some of those very soon. Um, but I'm always trying to get feedback from the staff because they're the ones who, when I'm not here, because I'm running around a restaurant depot or going to get catfish or whatever, <laughs> they're the ones who are interacting with our guests just as much as I am. So, um, and then of course I lean on our head chef, um, Armando Eden. So, um, he gets to have a lot of, you know, time to say, like, Julia, we want to run this as a special. It ran well as a special, put it on the menu. So I definitely do let some things go as far as like the creativity when it comes to the menus. Do you foresee in like, whether it's the near future or whether it's like years down the road that you will be handing as you get staff and as this, this establishment is here like longer, do you see down the road that you're going to be handing certain things off to people so that you can focus more on like growing the business? Yes, okay. absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, there's only so many hours in a day. I know I can't <laughs> be here to do every single thing. Um, and yeah, I have a lot of big plans for this place. So I tell them all the time, I need to just have my me time in the office, which is a broom closet, literally. Um, I need to have my me time so I can get my homework done, as I tell them, so they can you know, run this place. Let's go along with that. Can you, and I, there's probably no such thing as typical, but <laughs> can you, can you walk, walk us, the audience through a day from like the moment you wake up oh, goodness. to the time you put your head on the pillow and like close your eyes and just like all the things you have to deal with and what goes on in a given day. Sure. Run, running, running this, running this establishment, running this thing called Kim. I'll walk you through my Saturday. Okay. There you go. Because that's the only thing I can remember. I don't really, everything else is a blur. Okay. So Saturday, I woke up to a text message from one of my cooks asking for a ride to work. 
brought him to work, dropped him off. I went to Restaurant Depot, went and got a couple cases of chicken wings, came back, dropped those off, um, helped work on the registers, opened the registers, made sure they were balanced, welcomed the staff, made sure all the lights and stuff were turned on, all the TVs are turned on, all the music is set for the day. Opened the doors at 12. Ooh, this day is starting to get blurry again. Um, Doors open, lunch is going. Julia, we're out of such and such. Uh, ended up going to the grocery store again to get something else. Um, also going to the liquor store to load up because we need more pizza rock for the delicious black girl magic. Um, came back. Apologies ahead of time. <laughs> right. Came back, went in the office, worked on um, preparing for Juneteenth celebration and our one year anniversary. So uh, plotting. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, trying to figure out what we're going to do for those two things. So I was doing some research and brainstorming. By that time, it was almost time to switch over to dinner. We had a large group that was set to come in for 5.30. Uh, water polo, ladies water polo team. Um, probably 30, no, 26 people, 30 people. 30 people, all predetermined meals that they had given us. Uh, so we started prepping for that. Water polo team came in. We were still handling guests over in the front, in the dining room, in the uh, in the bar area. Uh, I welcomed the team, and then I left again because I had to go and get more cash from the bank to be able to tip out everybody for the end of the night. I came back. Dinner was fully underway. Water polo team was still here. Interacted with them. Hid in the closet. Did some more of my homework and paperwork. Um, working on paying some bills. And then um, I was the host for the rest of the evening. So my host had called out. <laughs> I was at the front door for the rest of the night. So um, walking guests there at a table, got a little distracted, ended up rolling silverware <laughs> mid-dinner because we went through all of it. Luckily, we got pretty busy. Um, so I rolled silverware, went back to host. I hosted, I rolled silverware, went back and forth. And then um, it was time to close. And then what did you have to do after closing? So I'm guessing it's not just <laughs> like, all right, and we're done. No, I had to tip out the whole, tip out the staff, do a walkthrough, make sure everything was clean and prepped for when we reopen on Tuesday. And then close out the registers, pack my stuff and drop off my cook. I guess you have to do work on like social media posts and branding and the website and all that good I, stuff too when you're not in physically in the restaurant, right? So, yes. Uh, that's also on my to-do list for today. Oh my God. Um, so yeah, I do all the social media posts. I do our email blasts. So in between, I'm always like trying to take photos for that and trying to develop content or reposting anything that's popping off. Yeah. So going along with that, what do you think people, what, what do you wish people knew like that they, that they don't know or they don't see when it comes to restaurants where it's just like, from like a pet peeve standpoint, it's like. Oh, my pet peeve? Yeah. From like, oh. a, like, a, like what people don't know about restaurants <laughs> that they like maybe take for granted or they don't know about the industry that you're just like, no, this, that's wrong. Stop it. No, I just wish people would wait at the host stand for a host. If there is a sign. Some places they let you just sit anywhere you'd like. Like but when the ones where there's a sign and they just start walking in. And it's yeah. Like, or just plop. Just plop somewhere. It's like, yeah, because that Please table wasn't wait. reserved. It's like, come on. No. And sometimes when we're really busy on the weekends, we will, like, we have a wait list. We will place people at the bar. So please don't come in and just plop at the bar because we might actually have reservation we're gonna to try to fill in there um what's my other pet peeve um i think i think sometimes um people don't realize that we're here all day long this is our job just like you have a job um on uh saturday 
I'm here morning till close. If I'm not running around, I'm here morning till close. So I'm up, what was it, Saturday? I opened the door for 9 o'clock for people to come in and start preparing for work for lunch service. And I didn't go home until like 12 o'clock. There's people on my staff that work doubles, maybe two times a week. They are tired. Please be kind. Have some manners. Yeah, manners go a long way. Understand it is not very easy, especially when we're huffing and puffing through masks because we want to keep other people safe. Yeah, just be kind. Food being, I, th I think there's this statement you had where it's like food is your love language, right? Yeah. This place is obviously a labor of love. Um, I almost cried three times during this and damn it's, and it's uh, And it's, uh, and like, and it's very much you, like it's very much you, your DNA, your family, your heritage, things that you care about. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's, that's like a key ingredient of like starting a business? Cause I, like you hear about people start businesses and it's not even something they're interested in, but they're doing it to like, you know, cash in on a craze, maybe flip something. It's just like, Hey, if you want to be an entrepreneur, be an entrepreneur or make your money. Yeah. But I... Do you think you can be more successful if it is like, putting yourself out there in the vulnerability really and having the emotion in there? Do you, do you think that there's like a, or do you think it's a balance of like, I feel like it two? depends on the industry. Okay. I, I definitely feel like it depends on the industry. I feel like if you're into retail and you're just selling something online, you don't really have to be super passionate about it. If you don't want to be, you can just be an entrepreneur and do what you want to do. But if I feel like when it comes to like service, if you're in the service industry, you got to be in for it with some passion. You got to go wholeheartedly into it. You can't just, you know, finagle a bagel. Going, going, um, not to like go against that, but do you think that like, all right, let's say you had two entrepreneurs and both were like selling whatever they're selling in the mm -hmm. same industry, right? Do you think if one is passionate about it and puts that out there that it helps build up that person's brand? What, maybe not, the, maybe not their own business, but like at least that their personal brand, if not that business and, won't that be received better? I think so. Because that can come through, you know? I think so. I think you want to purchase, whether it's a product or a service, from someone who is genuine. Like, you know, we make fun of, like, the sleazy sales, car salesman. Like, nobody wants to buy a car from him. Because, you know, as soon as you pull it off the lot, it's going to fall apart or like, it doesn't have a transmission yeah, in it or yeah. whatever, like my car. Um, so... You know, you really do want to, <laughs> you want to buy, uh, whether it's a product or service from someone who, you know, is giving off genuine vibes or does seem passionate about whatever product they are selling. I feel like it goes a long way. What were, in this entire journey of, of making this place a reality, Yeah. what were some things and some lessons you learned that you didn't expect? Um... Hmm. I learned that um, it doesn't hurt to be vulnerable. It doesn't hurt to ask people for help. Yeah. Um, kindness goes a long way. Being transparent goes a long way, too. That's an interesting one, the kindness, because I feel like so many times, especially in any kind of business, it's all about, you got to be cutthroat, and, like, you, you know, you can't be nice, and you're, like, walked all over. So I'm glad yeah. that you said that kindness goes no, a long way. No, I feel like, to a certain extent, I think that, um, you know, you can be kind and still, you know, not, be take, not get taken advantage of completely. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think... I mean, if you're giving off kindness, it'll come back to you, too. What advice, like, knowing what you know now, what mm -hmm. advice would you have loved to have gotten before starting this? Slash, like, what advice would you give to whether it's, like, a young creative wanting to be an entrepreneur or, like, a young restaurateur? Um, don't give up all of your savings. <laughs> Keep something in the back pocket for yourself. Put a little aside. Just put a little something aside okay. for yourself initially. It's cute to go all in. It's cute. But you're going to be cold if you do. No, but just make sure you do have something aside for yourself. Um, and if you're thinking about opening a restaurant and you have a budget in mind, fundraise to get double that because 
it goes quick if you if you really need to. I mean, in one year we've had everything from a little flood, a little fire, a little fight, everything, everything with an F we've had. So it's been a one very quick year, but it can be chaotic. You can rack up bills pretty quickly if you know if you're not on it. I'm trying to think of something funny with an F that I can't. Oh fuck! Right now. Right now. Or that, yeah. <laughs> all the fucks in here. All, we're giving all, all the, the fucks. All, yeah. <laughs> we're not not giving all the fucks. We're giving all the fucks. Yeah, we're giving all the fucks. <laughs> Make that title. So, giving all the fucks. <laughs> I give way too many fucks, which is why I've touched everything here. Give way too many fucks. With that, because <laughs> it, it's 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 been wait we're at the end. It's been a hell of a conversation. It's been awesome. Um, la- like and I like people are like a lot of times like we laugh, we cry. No, we literally Ooh. laughed and cried on this episode. <laughs> Holy shit! Um, so we're at the end and uh, stole this from a culinary show. Stole this from Hot Wings. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm not, I love that show. Not, not ashamed to admit it. So. Nobody has to eat a crazy plate of hot wings that's going to make them, well, cry, but not emotional tears, just more tears of pain. <laughs> but it's the end of the show. The floor is yours. Dun, dun, dun. Say, promote. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, another word for it. Um, articulate, pontificate, politic about anything you want. Oh, I'm impressed. Open mic. Very nice. Um, so we are coming up on our one year anniversary this year. We've been open March 30th was our opening date. Um, so look out for stuff for that. We'll be celebrating Juneteenth again this year. Last year we did our first annual block party, which was a success. People were dancing in the rain. It was amazing. I had to blast. Um, so we'll probably have some DJs out on our side street on Union Street. Um, but yeah, just come check us out if you haven't, if you like chicken and <laughs> even if you don't like chicken, if you just like a really good salad, our farm salad is delicious, by the way. Or if you like rum. If you like rum, if you like just talking loud in public, um, if you like listening to hip hop, R&B or reggae, what else do we play in here? Afro beats, old school music, earth, wind and fire. That's usually what we'll play on a Saturday morning. September will now be stuck in my head. Oh, I love September. I will now. It'll it's be clutch. it'll be three in the morning tomorrow morning, Do and all of a sudden, remember? yeah, I'll just be like, oh, I'm like, God damn it, Julia, <laughs> stuck in my head. <laughs> um, that's what you can find here, Kim. Yeah, and sass, lots of sass. We're all sassy in here. But it's but sassier than your car named Pearl. Mm. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> we. Jeez. We, we won't. I will, we'll leave it on that. And uh, honestly, just Ju- Julia, thank you so much thank to, hear, you. to hear your story, the story of Ken. And um, I will say as somebody who has, so has eaten at this establishment, that this is not all just conversation. This is not marketing. This is, brand, this is not branding. This really is when you walk in this door, you feel like you're at the barbecue. You feel like family. Oh, thank you. And so, like, because I got that vibe. Like, I've been to other spots where they say that, and it's not. That's not that way. I've been here, and personally, I got that vibe when did I walked I in the door. Did I yell at you? You did not. Did I yell at you like you, somebody's crazy auntie? You did not, but that would have been funnier if you did. I do do that. You, I left the people out cold on Saturday. I, I, if that would have happened, I would have actually been happier. But uh, <laughs> I would have, I would have had an even better story. But it would have been a funnier story I could have referenced here, but you did not. But you, but like the, everybody in this place, including made, made me and everybody I was with, so feel so welcome. So okay. everybody, it's not just a mission. Like it's it's real. So thank you so much for 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 doing this. Of course, I'm so glad I didn't chicken out. <laughs> but you gotta make that T-shirt. I got it. I gotta make the T-shirt. Until next time. <laughs> And that's it for this episode of The Creative Capital Show. Thank you for listening. And a special thanks goes to this episode's guest, Julia Broom. The Creative Capital Show is hosted, recorded, and produced by me, Jason Sylvia, with audio editing and mixing by Anthony Ferreira. You can listen to The Creative Capital Show over at our website, creativecapitalshow.com. We're also available on Anchor FM, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast hosting platforms. If you like the show, 
please subscribe. Helps the show out a lot. And be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I hope you enjoyed the show. And until next time, keep on creating.